Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us this morning and the first plenary session on global energy. Uh, this is a very timely subject. This morning I woke up and I was listening to the news. Oil prices plunged to its four years low. Yesterday, President Obama and the Chinese President Jinping uh, announced a, a joint, an, an historical joint agreement on climate change. So this panel cannot be more timely and news relevant than it is today. And for this reason, the organizers of uh, Med Days 2014, like usual, put together a great, outstanding group of speakers. And uh, I will be introducing each one of them, and each panelist would have a three to five minutes uh, brief presentation, and then a little discussion, and then we open the floor for anyone who has a relevant question about our subject. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Abbas Annaki, the Secretary General of OAPEC. Also, I would like to uh, welcome uh, the uh, Minister of State, uh, Jean-Louis Barlou of France, and also former Assistant Secretary of State from the United States, Philip Crowley. Also, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Belhul, Ahmed Belhul, the uh, CEO of uh, uh, Mazdar, and also from Germany, the director and a founder of uh, the Eco Ecologic Institute, Mr. Andreas Grimmer. So please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming our speaker this morning, and I will open the floor for Mr. Annaki, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, you gave us only three to four minutes, uh, of course. Uh, three to five, so it is very short. But anyway, let's start. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, let me first begin by extending my sincere appreciation to His Excellency, Mr. Ibrahim Fasri al Fahri, the Chairman of Amedias Institute, and to the Organizing Committee for giving us this opportunity to come here to Tangier and to talk about for the third time here, and I'm here and I'm very glad to be with our colleagues in Morocco. And also it gives me great pleasure to talk about this important subject entitled Global Energy Outlook, New Energy, New Politics. Uh, so just to use of the, the five minutes, I will go straight to the subject itself. And I will talk about two kind of uh, un unconventional uh, energy area, which is the first one, which is regarding to the renewables, and the second one will be uh, regarding the oil shale and, uh, and others. The, 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 with regard to the renewables, global installed capacity and production from all renewable technologies have increased substantially to the effect the renewable energy provided an estimated 9% of global energy consumption in 2012. The most significant growth occurred in the power sector. However, up to the year 2000, renewables were primarily represented in the world's electricity mix by hydropower. In fact, hydropower has, uh, has been around for a long time and it, it is still the dominant renewable source. But since the year 2000, there was an increase in renewables, especially wind and solar. Renewables are growing in the global energy mix, in particular in those regions that have put in place measures to promote their deployment. Arab countries, in, in, part in particular OAPIC members, with excellent solar and wind conditions across the Middle East and North Africa, MENA region, have planned to develop renewables despite their large oil reserves. In spite of the delay in a number of renewable projects due to the geopolitical developments, many countries in the region are now planning substantial hike in renewables energy capacity over the coming deca decades. Examples include the Shems Solar Power Station in the UAE, the planned Shems Mani Solar in 
in, far, in Jordan, Saudi Arabia is aiming for uh, staggering 54 uh, gigawatt of uh, renewable energy and other uh, solar capacity in Morocco, Egypt, to name few. And worth, and, and worth mentioning the new or expanding regional cooperation and institutional activities related to renewable energy include the establishment of arena and Masdar city in Abu Dhabi, the King Abdullah city for, atom for atomic and renewable energy in Saudi Arabia, the establishment of a regional center for renewables energy and energy efficiency in Egypt. For many Arab countries, including Arabic mem member countries, the contribution of renewables in the energy mix goes beyond the environmental benefits. Increasing the use of renewables fees more oil and uh, oil and gas quantities that can be ex exported or be put to better use other than generating electricity domestically. domestically. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, for un unconventional oil and gas, amongst the most important recent developments in the international energy market has been the development of unconventional energy sources, in particular, shale, shale and shale tight oil, or the so-called shale revolution in North America. Technological advances were mainly behind unlocking unconventional resources found in shale and other tight rock formation in North America, including shale gas and tight oil. The results are changing the U.S. energy industry and uh, landscape, leading to a re uh, resurgence of U.S. oil and gas production and bringing local gas prices to low levels. According to different energy sources, the U.S. to reduce its gas Im imports, gas exporting countries' markets have to be changed due to the significant changes in the gas trading patterns around the world. Oil, th oil trade pattern may be affected in, in, the, long, in the long run. But while light oil uh, from North, North Sea, North and West Africa declined, U.S. oil imports from some Middle East countries, especially heavy and medium grade producers, have increased. However, the impact on oil, oil prices have been less pronounced, while oil prices in the U.S. In the US have been kept down. Some are of the op opinion that the, the increase of around 2 million barrels a day during the period 2010 and 2013. And the U.S. tight oil supply has been a factor behind international oil price stability. Prospects for shale gas and oil production are growing, but uh, there remains considerable uncertainty regarding the size and ec economics of the resources. In fact, there are some legitimate environmental concerns with the specialized techniques used to used to the, ex to the extent that some countries, such as France, already banned hydraulic uh, fracturing. The production process of, of shale oil remains limited by several factors, including the relatively high, co high cost compared to the production of conventional oil, and the need for large amounts of water. And finally, the environmental uh, perspective and the difficulty of disposal of solid and liquid residues from the production process. However, this, the scale and the speed of the U.S. boom is unique and difficult to be replicated elsewhere. Furthermore, in relation to the economics of mo most Middle East uh, countries, Asia is their largest trading part, uh, partner, and it is expected to remain the primary source of growth in the, in the global demand 
for conventional energy resources. Thank you. By having, uh, by having said that, I, I thank you very much for your kind uh, attention to my speech. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Anaki. And now we move on to our next speaker, Mr. Jean-Louis Borloo. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je m'associe évidemment aux remerciements aux organisateurs et au think tank Amadeus. Trois mots simplement. Pensez une seconde qu'un continent sur la planète peut, hors Afrique du Nord, n'avoir que 30% d'accès à l'énergie. Alors que l'énergie, c'est l'eau l'eau potable, l'éducation, l'emploi, la croissance et la stabilité est une pure folie. Pensez que ça ne se saura pas chez les jeunes Africains, alors qu'il y a 600 millions de portables aujourd'hui en Afrique, c'est une pure folie. Pensez qu'il n'y aura pas d'incidence sur la déstabilisation en Afrique et un risque de fascisme en Europe est une pure folie. Comment penser qu'il y a d'un côté, à 14 km, un continent de 460 millions d'habitants qui va tangenter les 400 millions, avec de l'énergie partout et de la richesse partout. Et 14 km plus bas, un continent qui va passer de 1 à 2 milliards d'Africains en 30 ans, qui seront naturellement attirés par la lumière et la richesse. Pensez qu'il n'y a pas là le risque le plus grand de déstabilisation de cette partie du monde est une pure folie. Pensez une seconde que le chiffre de 5% de croissance en Afrique a un sens, alors qu'en réalité, il est beaucoup plus élevé là où il y a de la lumière et beaucoup moins, voire régressif, là où il n'y en a pas. Pensez une seconde qu'il n'y aura pas des migrations intra-africaines violentes et brutales vers les lieux de lumière et vers les lieux d'emploi est une pure folie. Pensez que le risque de d'urbanisation sauvage autour des grandes capitales africaines n'existera pas, est une erreur stratégique majeure. Alors aujourd'hui, les difficultés d'installation d'énergie, je pense notamment à l'électricité en Afrique, sont derrière nous. Je m'explique. L'électricité, à la différence des énergies fossiles, est l'enfant des vieilles nations organisées qui ont des finances publiques. Et la deuxième raison de, cette, de cet échec, elle est liée au fait que la production n'est pas chère, mais que la distribution est plus chère dans un continent qui est 15 fois moins dense que l'Europe. Or, aujourd'hui, les technologies décentralisées sont devenues peu chères et robustes. Et donc la seule question est la suivante. Quelle est la part de finances publiques internationales gratuites mises à la disposition du continent africain pour permettre de faire ce grand, marche, de, ce grand plan Marshall d'électrification de l'Afrique. C'est la seule question qui compte en termes géopolitiques. Et je vous le dis, sur ce continent à Tanger, au Maroc, qui a mené un programme d'électrification rurale exceptionnel, une des raisons du succès du Maroc, c'est cela. Et ça prouve que c'est faisable et que ça prouve que c'est possible. Je vous donne les chiffres, ils sont assez simples. Un plan a été élaboré avec tous les ministères de l'énergie du continent africain, pays par pays. Je vous la fais de manière très courte. Pour équiper 100% de l'Afrique, et surtout partout, c'est 300 milliards d'euros. 200 milliards privés disponibles. Il reste 100 milliards de starters ou de financements publics ou de subventions. 100 milliards pour un tel sujet, pour équiper un continent de 2 milliards de personnes dans 30 ans, c'est 10 milliards par an pendant 10 ans, 5 milliards pendant 20 ans. C'est une plaisanterie, cette affaire. La situation est proprement scandaleuse. Il faut ce plan Marshall. Il faut une agence unique africaine, pilotée par les Africains, sur des fonds automatiques, prévisibles et non conditionnels. Qu'on ne mélange pas les sujets de démocratie, de morale, et d'énergie. Les peuples n'ont pas à voir la double peine s'il y a des problèmes de gouvernance. Ce plan Marshall, on peut le monter. Techniquement, on en a pour sept ans. Et je dis à mes amis européens, ne vous y trompez pas. 
de deux choses l'une, où on fait ce plan et l'Afrique sera le premier relais de croissance d'une Europe fatiguée, atone, épuisée et qui n'a plus de projet, ou alors ça sera un chaos partiel en Afrique qui débordera sur l'Europe, l'Europe aura peur et nous aurons le fascisme. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Mr. Berlo, for your alarming and thought-provoking remarks. And now I yield the floor to P.J. Crowley, please. Uh, thank you very, very much. It's an honor to be back here uh, in Tangier and grateful to the Amadeus Institute uh, for, uh, for the invitation. Um, when I was asked to appear in this panel, I, I clarified and said, I'm not an energy guy. Um, so uh, I, I will talk about the uh, geopolitics of a uh, a very dynamic and changing uh, international environment surrounding the issue of, of energy. Um, you know, last night at dinner here, uh, Brahim uh, you know, Ferry talked about the fragmentation of the existing order. That certainly applies you know, to the energy sector as well. And you know, Saab Arakat you know, mentioned the, that there is order within chaos, and obviously there is a changing order within the chaos that, that we are experiencing. But certainly starting out from an American perspective, if you think back on the, the past 25 years, um, we've seen the decline of grand strategy. Um, the United States, as one example, has become a far more tactical country, you know, both from a policy standpoint and from a, uh, from a political standpoint. You know, those that might think there's a grand conspiracy around the world involving the United States, I assure you there's no there's no grand plan, but from, you know, the United States, for example, has been trying for 25 years to find a new organizing principle to replace, you know, the Cold War. Uh, in the 1990s, we started with globalization or integration, uh, and certainly that has uh, netted great benefits for the United States and great benefits for uh, the world, although everyone is still struggling to manage the uh, you know, the challenges around those who are the losers in this changing environment. And then in the 2000s, you had uh, a preoccupation with terrorism. It wasn't necessarily an organizing, you know, principle, you know, mixed with concerns about uh, the implications of integration, including the flow of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, I think in this decade, you've had a renewed emphasis on the quality of governance, and, and certainly you know, that applies in, in, in this region as well. But underneath all of those issues, you know, a, a constant thread has been um, you know, energy. Um, and uh, uh, I'm old enough to remember the, uh, you know, 40 years ago, the first time that from an American perspective, we felt uh, the, the pricing power of OPEC and the and felt the true cost of U.S. foreign policy uh, in, the, in the Middle East. Uh, now you have a changing you know, dynamic. Um, energy from an American perspective is still largely seen through uh, a domestic lens. Uh, and uh, it, it is transforming uh, the United States, in particular regions of the United States as we speak. If you're a resident of the state of Pennsylvania, for example, or a resident of the state of North Dakota, you've seen your economies you know, transformed in the last uh, several years. Uh, we're still sorting through how to balance um, an, an, an economy that uh, now has a favorable balance of trade regarding energy you know, with uh, lingering uh, environmental and safety concerns. And um, I think uh, it, the United States is slow to try to, uh, try to understand how to use this newfound power and the presumed leverage you know, that comes with it. And when you start to you know, push this out into the geopolitics uh, of energy, uh, obviously this has roiled uh, American and Western uh, you know, policies uh, over the past couple of years. You know, obviously the crisis with respect to uh, Ukraine and whether this represents a new Cold War uh, in terms of a struggle between the United States and Europe on the one side and, uh, and uh, Russia being willing to play uh, its energy card, uh, Trump card, as, a, as an example. You see it in Asia with 
um, all of a sudden unresolved border disputes that have taken on greater significance. Obviously, the source, the sources of energy uh, undergirding you know, many of that. Uh, my colleagues just talked about the prospect of growth in Africa, um, which is very, very significant. By the same token, you have you know, concerns about corruption, you know, the lingering effects of what people call the resource curse, uh, and, um, and these create opportunities. For example, in an exporting country like Nigeria, it is an issue that provides oxygen to a group like uh, Boko Haram. Um, but I think uh, um, if this is, a, is from a, you know, a, a, an underappreciated, the geopolitics of energy remains an underappreciated issue, uh, it, it is one of the remarkable stories here is perhaps the, uh, the de at least at a minimum, the declining impact of uh, OPEC in terms of its you know, pricing power uh, and uh, new relationships that are now developing around energy around the world. Uh, you know, everyone talks about a pivot between the United States and Asia. There's really a pivot between the Middle East and Asia. A lot of the energy that used to be uh, exported to the United States, that flow uh, is now uh, being reversed, and that flow is now heading you know, towards Asia. So these new relationships and what they, what in terms of their geopolitical significance, I think the dust has not yet uh, settled. Uh, in terms of, of, just to finish opening comments, in terms of what to expect from the United States going forward, you'll get a hint of that in the coming days uh, with respect to a decision that the United States Congress is likely to take with regard to the Keystone XL pipeline, a project that from a national security standpoint has a lot uh, to, to recommend it, but has been held back uh, by the Obama administration uh, out of concerns about its environmental impact, and then you've had some uh, internal uh, American you know, legal issues surrounding it. But there's been some ambivalence about that project, and, and but a, a, as, uh, as that, you know, that will be a, a manifestation of to what extent the United States now recognizes a newfound leverage as it becomes a exporting nation again and overtakes Saudi Arabia as the you know, leading producer of energy uh, in the world. Um, and uh, I think an, another aspect will be while this provides some useful leverage. You see it in terms of the sanctions regime with respect to Iran that has been helpful uh, and has uh, created an opening for the negotiation that is still ongoing and will come to a head here in the next you know, couple of weeks. By the same token, working cooperatively with Europe uh, while in the context of Ukraine, the United States has been able to add costs you know, to Putin's calculations in terms of, of how he plays uh, energy with respect to Europe. By the same token, it hasn't been sufficient leverage to necessarily change its calculations. So this is a useful tool. It will be something that the United States is able to use in the coming uh, years, but I think it is obviously going to be a limited tool. Thank you, PJ. And now, uh, Mr. Adnan Belhul, the CEO of Mustar, please. First of all, good morning. Um, I'd like to thank the Amadeus Institute for extending the invitation to be here. Uh, it's actually my first time in Morocco, and what a better place to be in than Tangier. Um, I haven't prepared an opening note per se, but let me allow, allow me to answer a question on behalf of the audience. Um, coming from a renewable energy company, which is based out of a region that accounts for a large proportion of the world proven hydrocarbon reserves, I constantly being asked the question of why is the United Arab Emirates pursuing renewable energy? Uh, for us, this makes perfect sense for a variety of reasons. Uh, first of all, if you look at it from an energy security perspective, um, the UAE, although has been blessed with all reserves, uh, we have not been so fortunate when it comes to gas. Today, we do import gas by pipeline from neighboring countries. We also import gas by LNG terminals. Layer on top of that, the sheer demand growth on energy. Uh, the IEA, for example, estimates that the global demand for energy will increase between 2.5 to 3% annually over the next two decades. In the UAE, it's triple that number. It's 
So the limited access of gas, the, the, the outstanding um, demand growth and electricity makes us as a country energy agnostic. So we take into consideration all forms and sources of energy. Today, the UAE is pursuing um, safe and peaceful nuclear power. We're also deploying uh, renewable energy as well. Uh, another element which you need to take into account is the peculiar nature of the UAE. In UAE, we are in a region where water is a very scarce resource, uh, and we produce water through desalination. In fact, 50% of global desalination capacity is in the Gulf, the Arabian Gulf. Now, this is a very energy intensive process. So for us, uh, securing energy is not only securing electricity, but it's also about securing water for us as well. So the energy water nexus is very strong in the region, hence energy security is very important for us. Uh, the fourth element is around economy. Abu Dhabi as an emirate has embarked on a 2030 vision of diversifying the economy away from hydrocarbons. Uh, this has started eight years back. Uh, today we have ventured in a variety of industries. For example, there is aerospace manufacturing in Abu Dhabi, uh, semiconductors, uh, healthcare, uh, aluminum smeltering. So renewable energy for us as an investment, both domestically and internationally, helps add a new sector to Abu Dhabi's economy and thereby just diversifying it even further. Last but not least, hydrocarbons would remain a significant export for the UAE. And by deploying domestic renewable energy, we both protect and extend the lifetime of that reserve. So if you look at it from all different angles, um, from the energy access, uh, from the water scarcity, economic diversification, and protecting and extending the life of our most valuable resource, renewable energy makes perfect sense for the UAE. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Belhoul. I'm sure you will have, uh, you'll draw a lot of questions from the public when we open the floor for Q&A. And now, Mr. Kremer, would you please tell us about what you know in Germany? I will, thank you very much. It is very nice to be back in Tangier and to be in Morocco and to continue the discussion that we had in the previous middays. Um, I would like to focus on the two things that you invited me for, an environmentalist from the country that is transforming its energy system. Um, I'll tell you that the world has a massive threat to our civilization and to the survival of humanity as we know it today. It is, of course, global overheating, the acidification of the oceans, with the prediction that we will not, no longer be able to harvest fish from the ocean, we'll lose the oceans as a protein source in the foreseeable future, the desertification that will devastate our croplands so we cannot produce enough food on the land anymore, and the sea level will rise and take our coastal plains away. After the discussion with Jean-Louis Borloo, there will be a separate panel on this issue, so I um, won't go into the detail here, but invite you to uh, uh, go to that panel. In order to meet that threat or to respond to it, we do have um, uh, strategies. There is energy efficiency. In the rich countries, we waste an enormous amount of energy. The estimates are between 80% of the energy that we produce is wasted to 95% is wasted. Germany is running one or one and a half nuclear power plants just to produce the electricity necessary to produce the compressed air that is then wasted in industrial applications, wasted for no practical use. That is the level of wastage that we have and that can be reduced for the benefit of the planet as a whole. We have renewable energy. They are coming down in cost. It is now cheaper to put up solar panels together with a battery that is cheaper than uh, building a, um, a coal-fired power plant or for operating a diesel-powered generator. It's not just the solar panels that become cheaper, but also all the technology you need around that. It is becoming very cheap to create island grids. You no longer need large integrated grids to cover a whole country, but you can power each individual home or each individual village. It reduces the capital cost of electrification in Africa a great deal, and there is great hope in that. But we do have a problem, and that is the incumbent power of our fossil industry and of our nuclear industry. They stand in the way in a very practical way because there is physical infrastructure that we have invested in, the sunk costs that they represent, but they're also 
deeply embedded in our political power structure, so it's very difficult to uh, develop strategies to shift from one energy to another because of that um, uh, opposition. And you heard it here today, uh, the focus on expanding the supply of fossil energy. We have too much fossil energy as it is. We know that of the 27 trillion, 27 trillion um, uh, uh, dollars of underground assets, that's oil, gas, only oil and gas, not even the coal, that is in the ground. It is valued at that level, it is represented in the balance sheets of the companies that own them. The capital markets of this world believe that this oil, this gas, will be brought out of the ground and will be burned so that the CO2 then goes into the atmosphere. If we do that, we will no longer have a planet that we can live on. It is quite clear that we have too much fossil energy already, and yet the G20 countries spend $88 billion every year in order to find more fossil energy, even though we have too much already. And you heard it, excuse me, I agreed with your last point, but I did disagree with one point, your comment about the nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is neither safe, nor is it clean, nor is it civilian. Wherever you see a nuclear power plant being built today, it is either because the people who make the decision are economically illiterate, very unlikely, or it is because they have a hidden military intent, very likely, or you have incredibly high levels of corruption. All of those elements are destabilizing countries and they are of geopolitical concerns, which is why it is worth highlighting them. Luckily, the solution that I sketched, expanding renewable um, uh, uh, energy, not only electricity, but also of other kinds, putting that into smart grids that are much cheaper to build than the infrastructure we had in the past. The technical solution is there. We have enough energy. The sun shines strong enough to supply 8,000 times all the energy we might possibly need with the number of people on the planet that we uh, can expect. In fact, we have too much energy. And at the same time, we also have too much capital. The fact that interest rates are cheap, are very low, even negative, all around the world is a sign that there is enough capital around to do everything we need to do. But there's another problem, and that is there are too many opportunities for those who have money to put it somewhere where they do not incur any risk. Our monetary policy in all the rich countries is destroying every incentive to look for creative, productive um, opportunities to invest that money. And that is, again, a concern, economic in nature, but uh, geopolitical in reach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before I uh, open the floor for Q&As, I would like to uh, ask a few questions to each of our uh, panelists, unless they have something to comment on what they have heard. But let me, let me start by what you just said, uh, Andreas. You talked about nuclear energy that is not safe, nor... Uh, what, what is the term used? But not safe, not, not clean. Not civil. Okay, is it, and you mentioned corruption and the military dimension of it. So it's not because of the technology, it's because of man's practice. So if you eliminate corruption and you secure and you have guarantees that it will not be used for military aims, would that be considered safe? No, because you, then you still have the operational risks. Um, we had the first civilian nuclear accident there where the core melted was in uh, Chalk River, Ontario in Canada in 1952. Since then, we had, depending on how you count, 10 or 12 serious accidents with core melts, one every five to six years approximately. We forget that because we do not have a continuous history writing and storytelling about all the nasty things that have happened. If you went and you tried to insure the operation of a nuclear power plant in the normal insurance markets, the electricity from nuclear power would be so expensive, even the nuclear power plants that we've built today would stop operating immediately. There is n absolutely nothing that would make a, an economic justification for operating nuclear power plants. It is, doesn't make economic sense. It makes military strategic sense because you accumulate knowledge, materials, equipment, manpower in the civilian nuclear sector that you can then also use in order to 
build up a military nuclear capacity. That is the intention of many countries. If you look at who is expanding their nuclear technology, um, one of your neighbors across the sea is, is one of those countries. Um, <clears throat> is it clean? No, it isn't. Even in normal operations, we have the release of highly problematic um, uh, substances into the environment, the health effects of which are understudied, um, but probably much more serious than is reported so far. We don't need to take those risks. We do not need to incur those costs because we have a cheaper and safer alternative in energy efficiency, in renewable energy, and in smart grids. Thank you very much. I have a question for Mr. Belhoul. Uh, you, you mentioned the diversification of the income to add to uh, oil income in the Gulf region, and mainly the case of the UAE. So far, for some reason, maybe I'm wrong, but the impression is that most of the time when you talk about diversities and, and, or trying to diversify incomes in the Gulf uh, region and mainly among oil-rich countries, it's just simply because you want to do that. It's subsidized by revenues by oil. Are they economically feasible? Do you have any case whereby all your efforts, whether it's in the agriculture and renewable energy that makes business sense or just simply sure. because you have the money and you want to do something that is politically correct? Um, this is always a natural misconception. People always assume that if you have access to capital, you want to diversify at any cost. But for us, I can speak of Mustar. I cannot comment on the nuclear comment because I'm not a politician and don't run a nuclear program. But when it comes to our focus on renewable energy, it has to make commercial sense for us. Now, obviously, the hosting countries, whether we invest in the UK through London RA or in Spain or even Abu Dhabi, um, renewable energy has not yet reached grid parity in every single city. And hence, the local governments support renewables. Uh, they support for a number of reasons, because as I mentioned before, you'd have to have a healthy energy mix, mm -hmm. which includes hydrocarbons, renewables, and others. So for us, we're a commercially driven company. We generate returns across all of our assets, and we are diversifying. We generate revenue to the, go to the government, and for us, it creates value, it creates knowledge, and we are able, in fact, to also amend certain technologies for our own context. And let me give you an example. Today, we have an investment in Spain, a solar investment, a CSP plant, concentrated solar power. We took that technology and brought it to our region. A big component of that is the water element. It uses a lot of water for, for cooling down. So what we did was is we used air cooling, and hence that specific plant uses 95% less water. So the point being made here is that we do get financial return, but also we get IP and know-how as well through that investment. And if you look at the numbers today, to your earlier point, 60% of our GDP is from oil. The aim is to move that to 40% by 2030. Um, I give the example of air structures. My colleague Badr al is running that company. It's a profitable company. Now, yes, that with any other country, it may be at the back of commercial contracts where you where the hosting country that places orders requires a local component, that is correct, but the company itself is operational in nature. Airbus was created through, a, through an offset exchange program with Boeing, so the UAE is pursuing the similar track. So in a nutshell, all the different industries generate value and we are diversifying. It's a long journey, but we're doing it year by year. Thank you very much. Uh, PJ, I have a quick question for you. Uh, I'm sure you've heard this when you travel to the Middle East. Most of the time, the US is accused of foreign policy inconsistency, double standards, and when you try to explore that, we see oil is behind that, pursuing interests. You talk values, you follow interests. Would, be, would the U.S. Be, uh, being less dependent on oil from the Middle East would make the U.S. more logical and change its policy when it comes to the Middle East so people can understand why you're pursuing that policy and why you're saying what you are saying? Well, um, the United States is always accused of doing too much in the Middle East and more recently not doing enough uh, in, in the Middle East. Um, I, I do think that um, uh, the, the Obama administration's pivot to Asia was to some extent either oversold or, or misunderstood. I, I don't see it as a zero-sum calculation that that a rebalance where you are re-engaging in a meaningful way in one part of the world necessarily means you're paying less attention uh, in this part of the world. Uh, you know, I would say that clearly um, 
the what the administration has done recently in terms of its reengagement in iraq its greater activity with respect to syria its ongoing interest in finding middle east peace i think assures a renewed and and continuous engagement in the region for the for the foreseeable future i i would say one the the policy will be shaped dramatically by what happens over the next you know two weeks or beyond i i still think that an agreement with iran is more likely than not i don't think it will happen by november 24 uh... but that that has significant implications in terms of regional policy i i do think that there is a question going forward at the at the heart of of u s policy for decades rooted in a uh... a requirement for energy assure energy security assured access to markets was the so-called carter doctrine that the united states will uh... do whatever is necessary to uh... protect the flow of oil from the Persian Gulf to the United States, the basis on that commitment is changing. Um, as you have uh, more sources of energy at home or in the Western Hemisphere, as the flow of energy shifts from the Persian Gulf towards Asia, I do think the United States will remain committed to assuring the flow of energy worldwide to create and maintain stable energy markets. But I think the United States will be looking to other countries over time to, to be full participants in security for the global commons that allows that to happen. Thank you, PJ. Uh, Mr. Uh, Berlow, I have a question for you. You talked about the need for a Marshall Plan in Africa. Who's going to take the lead? Is it the US or Europe? Do people understand the magnitude of what you uh, told us a few minutes ago? <coughs> oui, je vois parfaitement l'ampleur. Et pour tout vous dire, euh, en 2009, lors du sommet de Copenhague, la préparation plus exactement, l'Afrique avait décidé de parler d'une seule voix. L'Afrique avait décidé de ne plus être représentée par le G77, c'est-à-dire les Chinois, au titre des pays d'un aligné. L'Afrique s'était organisée avec l'Éthiopie, mais les Zénaoui, Jacob Zuma les francophones, le Maroc, pour que les chefs d'État et de gouvernement y aillent ensemble et fassent la même demande. Et à 5 heures du matin, il y a bien un texte qui a été signé qui prévoyait le fast start, c'est-à-dire un fonds de 10 milliards de dollars par an pendant jusqu'à 2020, montant à 100 milliards, pour permettre l'électrification en énergie non fossile de l'Afrique. Si on avait honoré cet engagement signé et validé par l'ONU, aujourd'hui, l'Afrique serait équipée en énergie à près de 75%. Simplement, le multilatéralisme est quelque chose de très compliqué et de très confus. Et c'est en tirant ces leçons que je dis aujourd'hui ici à Tanger qu'il faut que ce soit une agence unique dirigée exclusivement par les Africains. Car il s'agit de l'électrification de l'Afrique que les financeurs le font parce que c'est leur intérêt et de relais de croissance et géostratégique et par ce qui est en train d'être une panique en Europe, c'est l'immigration non choisie et non voulue. Quand je parle de risque de fascisme, je vous le dis, dans moins de 5 ans, 5 000 morts en Méditerranée cette année, mais vous aurez 40 à 50 000 morts dans 4 ou 5 ans. Les risques de déstabilisation du Nord viennent de la partie subsaharienne. Donc aujourd'hui, on est sur des jeux extrêmement faibles. Donc le leadership, il est forcément africain. Au niveau des chefs d'État et de gouvernement, et pas sous-traité, qu'il y ait un contrôle a posteriori des financeurs, pourquoi pas, mais ça peut être qu'un leadership totalement africain. Nous nous préparons à la conférence de Paris en décembre 2015. Si on attend Paris, on aura de la médiatisation, du, multi du multilatéralisme, et on en verra plus tard. Il faut rentrer dans l'opérationnel tout de suite. Je souhaite pour ma part que les 54 chefs d'État et de gouvernement d'Afrique signent la même charte, sur le même plan, sur le même programme opérationnel, 
avec les mêmes chiffres et les mêmes visions technologiques et qu'on prenne au mot la communauté internationale, à commencer par l'Europe, mais pas seulement l'Europe, mais un engagement ferme de l'Europe pour financer. Il faut bien comprendre que c'est le seul relais de croissance effective de l'Europe. Il n'y en a pas d'autre. Nos amis, alors il y a en Europe des pays qui ont des performances industrielles, je pense à nos amis allemands, sur un certain de secteurs, notamment les machines outils à l'égard de la Chine. Mais tout ceci va stagner à un moment ou à un autre. Le seul relais de croissance de l'Europe, le seul projet collectif d'une Europe qui s'ennuie, qui n'a pas de projet, qui n'a pas de rêve, c'est de faire avec l'Afrique le nouveau géant de l'humanité. La complémentarité entre ces deux continents est une totale évidence, mais si on continue pour des raisons anxiogènes liées à, à des sous-entendus, à, à, à la fin d'un néocolonialisme mal vécu de part et d'autre, enfin bref, si on continue à avoir ces appréhensions-là, mais on va vers un chaos incroyable. Pensez que le financement des énergies renouvelables en Afrique pour équiper le continent partout, je dis bien partout, dans les moindres villages, c'est quatre fois moins que le financement aujourd'hui par, par le consommateur allemand du formidable effort que fait l'Allemagne sur les énergies renouvelables. Ou c'est l'équivalent de ce que fait la France en bas des factures d'électricité, ça s'appelle la CSPE, pour le seul petit pays de France, c'est 5 milliards par an. Il faut moins que ça pour équiper tout Afrique. Donc le leadership, il est forcément africain. Évidemment qu'il est total et collectif. Ce n'est pas les lusidophones, les anglophones, les francophones, tout ça n'a aucun sens. Je suis convaincu, puisqu'on est ici au Maroc, il y a une compétence marocaine extraordinaire. Il y a eu, Sa Majesté avait nommé un ministre de l'énergie formidable, Amina Benkadra, qui a piloté ce plan. Les équipes de l'ONE marocaine travaillent déjà avec, pour l'instant, l'Afrique de l'Ouest, l'Afrique centrale, pour ces énergies de décentralisation. Ce qui est terrible, c'est qu'on sait le faire. On n'est ni sur un problème technologique, ni sur un problème financier. C'est l'investissement le plus rentable de l'histoire de l'humanité. L'Afrique n'attendra pas d'ailleurs, et la jeunesse et les peuples africains n'attendront pas. Et moi, ce qui m'angoisse en plus, c'est les écarts de richesse intra-africaines qui vont créer des déstabilisations extrêmement importantes. Donc, moi, je souhaite qu'avant le 30 juin, dans le cadre d'une fondation, enfin, peu importe, ce plan soit signé par tous les chefs d'État et de gouvernement d'Afrique, précis, financier, gouvernance, comment on rend des comptes, comment c'est validé, et que Sa Majesté soit évidemment, et le gouvernement marocain, euh, dans un grand leadership dans cette affaire. Thank you. Monsieur Anaki, briefly, uh, you, before we open the floor to Q&A, We heard some alarming figures, some important subjects. What are you doing to educate the public opinion? So far, when we talk about global energy, environmental issues, it seems like an elitist subject. Only people talk about it in, in settings like where we are today. What are you trying to do to educate the public opinion so the government can make it a top priority? Thank you very much. <coughs> again. Uh, I heard I, I listen very well to your question and to also to uh, answers from my colleagues uh, and, and the panels. Of course, I have some uh, observations regarding their uh, answer to that. The, 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 the first one, uh, we heard that uh, the, the nuclear energy itself, uh, it, it may not be uh, a safe kind of energy, of, of, of energy for the uh, maybe for the future and anti danger of course. At, at the same time, we can see uh, that there are many, many countries now they are g going to, uh, to do so regarding the, uh, uh, the nuclear energy itself. And also, the, 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 the effect of renewables and others to oil producing com countries, to, uh, let's say, to the conventional oil, uh, oil and gas, and also, let's say, uh, coal. So here we are talking about the fossil fuel itself, all total. 
I think all, all these kinds of renewables, they are complementary to the oil itself because we believe that there is, the, and, and uh, many, many studies and uh, predictions say that there will be a great demand on oil and gas in the future. Although there, uh, there, is, uh, th there are other sources of energy to come, such as uh, renewables, but of course, uh, as my colleague said, the, all these all these kind of energies j just to complement or, or or to be complementary to the uh, oil and gas for the uh, for the future. And also, just re uh, regarding the whether the, the United States uh, to, to stop importing, for example, uh, oil and gas, and, and in the future, I believe this is my. Uh, Personal belief also because we know that shale oil and gas oil they have a, a, a limited age, a, a limited time, and they are uh, they are uh, after uh, maybe uh, ten years, twenty years, and this, it is very limited. And uh, after that, uh, may they go back again to upper. But the imports from all oil producing countries and uh, either from OPEC or non OPEC oil producing countries will continue. This is my belief, and uh, to decades to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now, please, I open the floor for anyone who has a, a question related to the subject of our discussion this morning. Please, we have uh, 10 minutes of questions and answers because we have to see a movie about Mazdar, which I urge you to, uh, to stick around to watch it. It's very interesting. Uh, please state your name and who do you want to answer your question. And please make it a question, not a statement, nor a speech. Thank you very much. The gentleman here, please. Mike, one second. Uh, Jawad Kardoudi, président de l'Institut marocain des relations internationales. Ma question s'adresse à Monsieur Borlo, en tant qu'ancien ministre de l'Environnement. D'ailleurs, je suis un peu étonné qu'il n'ait pas parlé d'environnement, étant donné qu'il est surtout connu pour ça, et lui dire quelle est sa position sur les problèmes énergétiques de la France et notamment concernant le nucléaire qui a été beaucoup attaqué par M. Kramer. Merci. M. Barlow. Quand on parle d'un programme Marshall d'énergie renouvelable en Afrique, on parle de climat. Pourquoi L'Afrique est déjà le continent le plus frappé par le dérèglement climatique, le plus touché. Il suffit de prendre des photos aériennes du lac Tchad il y a dix ans et aujourd'hui. Et il suffit de regarder année après année le recul de la forêt en Afrique. Il faut bien avoir en tête, Monsieur le Président, que 80% de l'énergie utilisée en Afrique est d'origine forestière, plus exactement du bois de chauffe. C'est pour ça que je dis au reste de l'humanité, les deux grandes réserves carbone, c'est la forêt et la mer et les océans. L'Afrique est un contributeur majeur à la régulation climatique par sa forêt. Et laisser continuer cette déforestation liée à la nécessité, à la pauvreté, par ce qu'on appelle le bois de chauffe, est un crime contre l'humanité pour les voisins du continent africain. Et donc, je vous dis, monsieur le Président, euh, cette affaire, d'ailleurs, elle sera bien si elle est financée, parce que pour que ça soit financé, il faut que la question soit posée opérationnellement. Personne ne pourra dire non à un tel programme. Personne. Mais ça sera bien financé au titre de l'atténuation ou de l'adaptation des grands rendez-vous climatiques. C'est bien pour ça que c'est un sujet environnemental. L'environnement, c'est sortir du cercle vicieux de la pauvreté, de toutes les pauvretés, des réfugiés de la pauvreté comme des réfugiés climatiques qui sont en réalité les mêmes. Quant à la France rentrerait pas dans le climat nucléaire, pas nucléaire. La France a eu historiquement une stratégie nucléaire, technologique, forte, 
avec d'ailleurs les Américains en, en son temps, avec Westinghouse, c'est les deux grands piliers scientifiques. La stratégie, la stratégie française est une évolution proportionnelle beaucoup plus importante sur les énergies renouvelables que sur le nucléaire, bien entendu. Je ne crois pas que les ruptures trop rapides, je réponds à notre ami allemand, moi je, je comprends leur stratégie et je l'approuve, la vitesse d'exécution peut poser problème lorsqu'on constate que ça a été pour l'instant supplanté en partie par l'augmentation de la production ou du moins de l'utilisation de la lignite et du charbon, ce que je comprends et qui est nécessaire, ce qui en termes de dérèglement climatique pose un petit problème. Mais sur la stratégie globale allemande, moi je, je, je l'approuve tout à fait, c'est ensuite un problème de rythme et d'adaptation. Andreas, I can let you rebattle that one if you make it brief because I have a question here. Yes. Quickly, please. Thank you very much. And I do want to say that it is so nice to hear expressed in good French what I try to say in English. Um, but on this last point, um, we have expanded the renewable electricity much faster than we have slowed down and closed down nuclear power plants. The expansion um, of renewable electricity in Germany has reduced the need for fossil energy. And yes, there has been some increase in the use of coal because Putin charges too high a price for the gas and because we export so much electricity to our French and Dutch neighbors when they need the electricity. It's a market transaction. Coal is too cheap and the European emission trading system is too cheap. The credits are too cheap. And as a consequence of that, economically, there is too much coal, which the Americans like to export to Europe anyway. Thank you very much, Andreas. Please, I have a question here. The lady, please stand up, state your name and who you represent and who do you want to answer your question? Merci. Uh, je m'appelle Maria Luisa Abrantes. Uh, je suis d'Angola, Agence Nationale pour l'Investissement uh, Privé. Uh, la question, c'est pour uh, Monsieur Borlo. Euh, J'aimerais euh, savoir, pour les pays qui n'ont pas de pétrole, comme vous avez dit qu'il y il avait besoin de 10, millions, euh, de 10 milliards par, an, par année, euh, qui va le substituer euh, pour payer euh, cet montant Et quel est le papier des, des investisseurs euh, privés, direct privés euh, Car je ne pense pas qu'on doive seulement transférer les technologies et vendre des équipements et des services. Merci. Monsieur, madame, lorsqu'on regarde tous les financements ou privés ou publics, mais qui ont vocation à être remboursés, donc la dette structurée pour un pays, pour un équipement, je vous donne un exemple. Ça peut être HSBC, puisqu'ils sont très présents chez vous, mais c'est la Banque européenne d'investissement qui regarde dans le plan de relance de 300 milliards un soft commitment de 50 milliards pour ce plan Marshall pour l'Afrique. Donc ça, c'est de la dette structurée. Tous les analyses convergent sur le point suivant, sur l'ensemble du programme. Il faut deux tiers de dettes remboursables, publiques ou privées, et un tiers de financement à risque, qui soit du capital ou de la subvention. Chère madame, il y a un, une incompréhension internationale qui est la suivante. On dit l'Afrique, alors les Afriques, mais on, il faut raisonner globalement sur un continent... C'est parce qu'on n'est pas sûr du remboursement que la finance internationale ne finance pas aussi fortement que l'on croit. Comme si ça serait une spécialité africaine. Mais en réalité, l'électricité dans tous les pays du monde s'est fait avec des investissements publics au départ. Tout le temps et partout. Il n'y a aucune raison que ça ne soit pas le cas en Afrique. Et je crois qu'on converge à peu près tous pour dire qu'il faut un tiers d'investissement public et deux tiers d'investissement privé. Et si vous mettez ces deux tiers en créance de premier rang, vous n'avez globalement pas de grandes difficultés de financement. Alors maintenant, 
D'où vient ce tiers et pourquoi le ferait-il Il vient d'abord, quel est le continent qui a le plus intérêt C'est le continent européen. C'est une évidence. L'Europe et l'avenir, l'Afrique est l'avenir de l'Europe. C'est tellement simple et évident à comprendre. Et puis un intérêt défensif. La peur d'une immigration mal contrôlée. Ne vous y trompez pas. Un continent de 500 millions qui descend et d'un milliard qui monte. Le choc, il sera d'une extrême violence. Et on ne le réglera pas en améliorant les organisations interna internationales euh, de, de protection du sud de l'Europe, Schengen, Frontex et autres. C'est bien sur le continent africain que ça doit avoir lieu. Donc, euh, les, pour moi, les choses sont, sont relativement simples. C'est l'intérêt. Mais c'est aussi l'intérêt de nos amis américains. C'est aussi l'intérêt de nos amis indiens, qui ne sont pas si loin. C'est aussi l'intérêt de nos amis chinois, mais d'abord nos amis américains, qui, comme les Européens, ont en plus cette dette à l'égard de l'Afrique, comme nous. Parce que quand on, on émet 22 tonnes de CO2 par habitant et par an pour un continent qui émet quelques centaines de kilos par personne et par, et par an, eh bien, c'est aussi l'intérêt et la conscience des États-Unis. Et j'observe d'ailleurs que le président Obama et que sa majorité a décidé un programme « Power in Africa », certes étonnamment ciblé sur sept pays, l'étonnement n'est pas lié au choix, ça regarde les États-Unis, mais pas dans un processus d'un plan Marshall global, mais je pense que tout ceci peut et doit converger. Thank you very much. I have room for one more question because we have to see the short film that I told you about. Last question, please, right here for the gentleman, the front, front row. And I apologize for those who have uh, Merci, questions. Uh, Omar Asnawi, uh, président de la Fondation Helios pour le développement durable. Uh, ma question s'adresse à Monsieur Borloo. So, but, but if you want, he will be having a discussion later on. He will be more than happy to answer all your questions later on. So if, do you mind saving that question to the discussion that he is going to have after uh, this session? I, I have a very small please. question. Please, okay. quickly, please. Uh, ma question s'adresse à Monsieur Jean-Louis Borloo. Euh, vous avez tout à l'heure évoqué euh, euh, l'accord euh, conclu entre la Chine et les états unis pour la réduction des, de la production de, des CO2 euh, et, et je, je me félicite pour cela mais vous savez que le photovoltaïque et l'éolien ne sont pas suffisants pour permettre à des pays comme euh, émergents ou en voie de développement comme le Maroc et les pays africains d'atteindre un niveau de prospérité euh, suffisant. Euh, il faudrait suppléer à cela par d'autres énergies. Et je pense à l'énergie nucléaire. Tout à l'heure, elle a été évidemment dénoncée euh, comme étant une énergie... La question, s'il vous plaît. Oui. La question est... Que pensez-vous des... Les États-Unis développent actuellement des petites centrales nucléaires de, 5 à 50, de 10 à 50 MW, mobiles et transportables que pensez-vous pour l'avenir de ces, ces euh, unités euh, euh, d'énergie nucléaire qui, qui sont de petite taille et qui sont moins euh, polluantes, peut-être Merci. Merci, monsieur. À partir du moment où ce plan Marshall ne coûte presque rien s'il y a tout le monde, il faut qu'il y ait tout le monde. Et donc, n'ouvrons pas de débat qui pourrait fissurer cette grande alliance. Vous avez des États, des peuples qui sont contre l'énergie nucléaire, d'autres qui considèrent que c'est un moindre mal, d'autres qui considèrent que c'est une technologie d'avenir. Par rapport à l'enjeu que nous avons sur ce continent extraordinaire, ainsi d'ailleurs que sur la pointe sud de l'Inde, pour être tout à fait précis, compte tenu de cet enjeu, nous avons besoin d'une unanimité. Et donc, je ne répondrai pas à cette question parce que ma priorité, moi, ma conviction absolue, c'est qu'on est tout prêt, avant le mois de juin, de pouvoir lancer ce plan Marshall. Tout prêt. C'est l'intérêt objectif de chaque peuple d'Afrique. C'est l'intérêt objectif de chaque gouvernement d'Afrique. C'est l'intérêt objectif des industriels et des entreprises européennes. C'est l'intérêt des industriels chinois et indiens. 
c'est l'intérêt de la croissance mondiale. C'est le principal relais de croissance. Alors, pas de débat religieux ou trop mythologique sur les énergies, parce que ça va nous diviser inutilement face à l'enjeu. Thank you. Uh, please, the lady. But before the microphone reaches you, PJ, you had a quick remark. Please go ahead. But please make it brief. Oh, I, I was just going to say the, the, the one significance, it seems to me, of the U.S.-China agreement is that it, it represents, I hope, a, a change in the conversation about uh, you know, climate change. Back to Copenhagen in 2009, um, you were still caught in the you know, developed world, developing world, China saying that we are a developing country, we didn't create the problem, we don't have to be necessarily part of the solution. Hopefully now they've recognized that, that there's actually uh, economic and technical opportunity uh, in embracing renewable energy, particularly solar, and then bringing those to market uh, in, a, in, in a way that, that is affordable. So I, I think that there's, there's a, hopefully, a fundamental change. And if China's leading the developed world in terms of recognizing that the, developed wor the developing world has to uh, uh, progress in a less carbon-intensive way than its developed world colleagues, that will be significant progress. Thank you, PJ. Uh, please, the lady. Oui, your, your name and who you okay. represent and who you want to, add, to answer uh, your question. Uh, uh, je m'appelle Rawia Mansour et je suis uh, la chef de boîte qui s'appelle Wadis Technology de Monaco et aussi uh, de uh, Sustainable Development uh, d'Agriculture en Egypte. La question d'abord à monsieur, uh, son excellence, Monsieur Borlo, que je uh, félicite pour sa concern pour l'Afrique et sa transpar being transparent. Et c'est pour euh, l'énergie renouvelable et pour en assigner toute l'Afrique. C'est seulement pas de faire l'électricité, c'est aussi qu'on était dans le il y a Agenda 21 qui a existé depuis. La question, c'est la question, c'est que pourquoi on fait pas les dans le Agenda 21 dans des constitutions des pays arabes pour avoir le feeding tariff pour laisser les investisseurs à investir avec le public. Voilà. Merci. Bon. Monsieur Borlo. En fait, ça se fait. Je rappelle que sur proposition euh, européenne, mais à l'époque franco-allemande, Zygmar Gabriel et moi-même a été lancé ARENA, qui est l'Agence mondiale des énergies renouvelables qui est l'agence qui regroupe tous les pays du monde pour étudier les technologies, la recherche, les financements en matière d'énergie renouvelable. Où est-ce qu'elle a été installée, cette agence Aux Émirats. C est, c est, c est, nous sommes, nous, convaincus que les pays de l'ensemble de cette sous-région sont déjà dans cette mutation, mais ils ont les moyens économiques. Alors, je ne mets pas l'Égypte dans cette catégorie, hein, je suis un petit peu plus au nord. Mais la prise de conscience de l'ensemble de cette partie du monde, que l'avenir est en mutation et qu'ils sont prêts à financer des programmes d'électrification non fossiles ailleurs que chez eux et chez eux, elle est acquise. En réalité, les fondations, les États sont en mouvement. Alors, peut-être passer, peut-être faut-il l'organiser par des procédures type agenda. Vous avez probablement raison. Mais si ce n'est pas fait, en tous les cas, pour ma part, j'ai une grande confiance dans la capacité de ces pays, en fait, à aller vers ce type d'évolution. C'est pour ça que ce n'est pas un focus particulier. Before we start our short film, Mr. Anaki has a few uh, remarks and he promised me to make it brief. Thank you very much, Mr. Reis. In the fact, I listened this morning to the topic of the changes in the climate change. And we, in the beginning, of course, we will be able to show the new changes in the climate change. And as we mentioned in the beginning, it is a complete changes in the climate change. 
الى جانب ذلك لكن هناك ايضا موضوع التغيرات المناخيه الموضوع التغيرات المناخيه ليس يعني موضوع التغير المناخي ليس فقط موضوع بيئي كما يذكر الكثير ليس موضوعا بيئيا فقط وانما موضوع التغيرات المناخيه هناك اسباب اخرى لان لان نرى الاتحاد الاوروبي عنده اهداف تارجت وضعها للتقليل من اعتماد الاتحاد على الفصل الفيول او او الوقود المحفوري سنه 2050 بنسبه كذا وكذا وكذا. هذا يعني هاي نقطه اساسيه يجب ان نعرفها وايضا الفحم والذي يعتبر من من اكبر الطاقات الملوثه للبيئه نرى ان هذا النوع من الطاقه في 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 الكثير من الدول يدعم سبسيداج يعني يعني موضوع الفحم يعني المفروض ان لما نتكلم عن الموضوع البيئي فقط يجب ان نكون فعلا بيئيين نبتعد عن المصادر التي تلوث هذا النوع من او او هذه البيئه وايضا في في اتفاقيه الاطاريه لتغير المناخيون اف سي 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 البيس يير 1990 يعني 1990 لحد الان نحن نحن مقبلون على 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 كوب 20 او 21 في ليما في بيرو في يعني بعد شهر الى الان لم تلتزم هذه الدول التي وقعت الاتفاقيه بالوصول الى الى سنه الاساس الى سنه البيس الى البيس يير فيجب ان يكون هناك يعني فعلا محاوله او او, أو الكثير من الجهود للجماعات التي فعلا انشات هذه الاتفاقيه من جانبها خصوصا الدول الصناعيه هنا نتكلم الدول الصناعيه اما الدول الاخرى التي تقوم بالخيارات الطوعيه فولنتري بيسز فهذه طبعا راجع لها وقامت الى الان بدورها واسف على التاخير شكرا اخ عباس والان اترككم مع الفيلم الصغير اللي حنشوفه سوا عن مصدر Energy, the source of all life, in sunlight, wind, waves, and beyond. Mankind depends on new sustainable ways to recover it, harness it, and shape it to meet the demands of tomorrow. Mazda is a new kind of energy company with a challenging mission and a clear purpose. Pioneering a path to the future, leading the way and transforming how the world will produce and consume energy. Through our holistic approach to renewable energy and clean technology, from academia and research to investment and technology deployment, working harder and looking further for innovative sources of clean energy to power the world. Mazda operates through three integrated business units, complemented by a research-driven graduate-level university. Mazda Institute of Science and Technology is a world-class research-driven university, incubating innovation and developing critical thinkers who will create the breakthroughs of the future. Mazda Capital invests in the world's most promising clean technologies, delivering the financial and management expertise to transform big ideas into powerful businesses. Mazda Clean Energy develops the most innovative and large-scale renewable energy and carbon abatement projects, making clean energy a reality. Mazda City, an investment and a free zone, and a test bed for research, innovation and business. Powered by renewable energy, Pushing the boundaries of sustainable urban planning, architecture and construction while testing and implementing energy efficiency technologies that have a true global impact. This know-how, tried and tested by Mazda, will be exported far and wide. Together we are Mazda, one team with a truly inspiring vision. 
Complementing today's fossil fuel economy with the energy economy of the future, we are developing the true green print for how we'll live and work tomorrow. We're developing it here in Abu Dhabi and offering it to the whole planet. Backed by the Mubadala Development Company, we're bringing the UAE's long-term vision of future energy to life, right here, right now. We're using the power of knowledge to diversify our economy, to build a truly sustainable world. Mazda, advancing the clean energy future.